Order the January 25th meeting of the ACSD board. Um, just a quick couple of notes with regards to agenda uh, before we get started. We're going to have to add an executive session to this meeting um, to discuss a student issue. Uh, so the way that that will work is when we go into executive session, we'll ask folks who are in as attendees to um, leave the meeting. We'll go into executive session and then we will come back in to out of executive session to finalize the meeting. Um, and then the other point is I know um, folks on the board received an email, I believe today from a constituent uh, with regards to wanting to um, communicate with one of our consultants. Um, we don't have that on the agenda today, so we're going to push that discussion off to our next board meeting to discuss that. Um, all right, so let's start off with introductions. I'll do a little roll call and please introduce yourselves. Peter B. Peter B, superintendent. Chip. Malcolm. Mary G. Mary Gill. Great. Lorraine. Lorraine Morse. Thank you. Will. Will Hatch, Director of Technology. Suzanne. Buck. Jory. Jory Jacobite. Jen. Jen Newseater. Vicki. Vicki Wells, Director of Student Services. Victoria. Victoria Jetty. Jen, you win the background contest tonight. <laughs> Betty. Betty Kafumbe. Brittany. Brittany Gilman, business manager. Kathy. Kathy Demon, high school assistant principal. Davina. Davina Damari. Caitlin. Caitlin Steele, Director of Teaching and Learning. Kyle. Kyle Mitchell. Um, Kyle, just a heads up, your audio is a little broken up, so I don't know if it's a connectivity issue, but just um, so that you know. Uh, Amy M. Amy McGlashan. Um, and I think I'm assuming that's everyone on my screen. Did I miss anybody? I'll let Kathy on. introduce the students when we start that part of the process. Peter's up there. Peter too. Conlin just. Peter's Conlin. Oh, Peter C. Uh, hi, everybody. Peter Conlin. Great. Um, super. Do you want me to read off the attendees? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we've got Chris Kramer, Barb Wilson, Bruce McIntyre, Denise Birdholf, Hugh McLaughlin, Joanna Doria, MCTV, Molly Kerr, Ruth Bernstein, Tony Scuteri, and Tina Wright. Great. Thank you. Uh, next up, as always, uh, public comment. If you wish to make a comment, uh, please raise your Zoom hand. Uh, Peter B. will then bring you over into the panelist section, and then after your comment, we'll place you back into attendee. Okay, I'm going to bring over Chris Kramer. Hi, folks. Uh, so the uh, the email that Mary mention came from me and I just want to uh, I don't yeah I understand uh, moving it off till the next meeting I'll probably reach out to those consultants in the meantime um, so I just want you know if you want to discuss it tonight um, I think it's I really all I'm asking is just to give them a heads up um, that I'll be reaching out to them um, but you know if if, if, that, if that's out of scope that that's fine um, but I just wanted to clarify that I'll, I'm going to reach out to them either way sort of between now and then. So I think, you know, if you want to discuss it tonight, great. If, and, and decide it's, they're sort of not authorized, 
to speak until you guys have had more of a chance to um, to discuss that. That that's fine. Um, but uh, just I just wanted to make sure you guys had that heads up that I'll I'll be reaching out to them. Next, we have Tina Wright. Thank you. Um, I hit the wrong button and got rid of the screen. Um, I have just a couple moments tonight, um, but thank you all for gathering. It's greatly appreciated. Um, I'm actually just going to uh, read two small paragraphs um, from a book that um, fell off my shelf a week ago, um, Music in Rural Education. And um, to properly cite, the book is Music in Rural Education by Osborne McConathy, W. Otto uh, Messner, Edward Bailey Burge, Mabel E. Bray, in collaboration with these authorities on rural education, Fanny Dunn, Frank Beach, and Josephine Murray. Um, and it is a Silver Burdett Company book, um, copyright 1937. Um, these two paragraphs are from the uh, preface in the book. In carrying out these ideals, it has been thought wise to consult those educational leaders who have firsthand knowledge of actual rural school conditions. The names of those these consultants on the title page of this book and of those persons whose special contributions are acknowledged on page four give ample assurance of the practical nature of the proposed plans and procedures. And the uh, second paragraph. The experts in rural education who have contributed to this book convince us that the conditions of rural life need not be considered as limitations, but rather as opportunities. They make it clear that beautiful fine music can be brought into the lives of children in rural schools. They show that the course of study can embody much more than the desultory singing, which too often has passed for music instruction. And that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. You're muted. Thank you all very much. I think at this time, uh, we turn it over to Kathy. Great, thank you. So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce 11th grader Zora Duquette Hoffman and 12th grader Nick Sukumel. We're here to share how our MUHS music department is creatively adapting to this very unusual year. So take it away. Do you want to go first or should I go first? Uh, either way works for me, sorry. Okay, cool. Um, I'll just go first then, I guess. Um, so basically, um, I'm going to talk about band and pretty much the more instrumental side of the music department and how they've basically been able to combat this. Um, so first of all, um, basically, because it's remote learning, we can't, or because it's remote learning, and even though we have in-class instruments, we can't really do like wind instruments in class because that's basically throwing spit all over the classroom, which you don't really want to do because that spreads COVID really, really like a lot. And that's really bad. Um, so we basically due to that, um, due to remote learning, basically people and band and jazz ensemble use the online platform smart music to rehearse music. And that was back in last spring when we were fully remote. So that was nice and helpful. Um, students in band also were able to compose pieces based on our experiences with the pandemic using Soundtrap and students in jazz learned 
continued to learn the standards and improvisation for jazz and recorded themselves with the app iReal Pro and were able to continue experimenting with changing styles and personalize their experiences. And that's kind of just last year. I'm sorry, I should have introduced that first, but that's kind of as like a background. So that's kind of what we were doing when we were fully remote. Um, so this year, when we were this school year, um, it's that basically, like I'd said, um, since we can't really do actual instruments, um, there's been a couple problems such as that. Um, we haven't been able to also because band is so big, we haven't been able to schedule band for everyone just because we need to spread it out amongst a lot of blocks. And also with the new, also with IB and especially people who are in the diploma program, it's really, really hard to actually get band into your schedule for a lot of those people. Um, so that's a problem that we've had to do as well. Also just from being stressed out from the IB program has caused a lot of people to drop band as well. So that's another issue. Um, so, and I believe at this point we have two cohorts of band, which means four periods of band a week, which ranging from eight to 20 students in the class is the current setup that we have for band. Um, and, and like I said before, we can't really do wind instruments. So there are bright sides to that. Um, so since it's small and Miss Every over her years of teaching have gathered many, many mallet instruments, as well as these wonderful steel drums that sound awesome. Um, we were basically doing that for the entire first semester. So we were playing this gigantic mallet ensemble. We did, we worked on tons of different pieces. We had a Beatles medley that we worked on, which is really, really great and sounded really cool because it's this like pitched percussion kind of vibe with the entire thing. Um, and we basically did that and Miss Severy made, in, and since we couldn't have concerts, Miss Severy also made these in-class concert videos of us performing, which I think she then shared to either Facebook or somewhere where it was widely accessible. I'm not sure the exact platform, but it was definitely shared in a wide place. And, oh, actually it says right here, I'm sorry, um, that was shared online through the community through Mr. Campbell's weekly newsletter and an email from her as well. Um, so for band, we did also did a lot of more creative projects this year because we're remote. So we have more time to do that since we're not always playing in band. Um, so we wrote a rap this fall based on a Nike commercial, Just Be Better, and then composed music to it and added a video, which was a lot of fun. And a ton of people had really, really amazing videos. And it was just, and then we also got to see them all in class, which was amazing because you just got to see everybody's work and it was just really, really beautiful. Um, we also worked on ear tra training at the beginning of every class. This is something that we've done in past years where it's rhythmic dictation, where she sings rhythm to it and then she sings a rhythm to us and then we basically write it down in music notation. Um, and that has worked out pretty well because she just uses a microphone and with the mask, there's no risk to spreading COVID whatsoever. Um, and we are still able to do that, which helps strengthen our musical skills. Um, we also continue to play our instruments at home through the platform Smart Music to record assignments. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Smart Music, it's basically this platform that has music compositions on it, but then also allows you to record yourself playing to it and then basically runs your recording through a software that tells you how accurate it was, both with pitch and rhythm. And also it has a counter so you know where you are and it also has the rest of the band. So it feels like you're playing with a band even though you're really not, which is really, really great because it gives you that ensemble feeling of playing even though you're doing something else, which is great because and it works great for remote. And that's what we did last year too, which worked out really, really well. Um, also beginning this month, um, we we're starting a classical guitar ensemble. So Miss Every ordered a ton of these classical guitars. They're really, really cool. I think they're like nylon string. They're really great. Um, but basically we're just learning classical guitar now, which is awesome because, because the problem with the mallets was that we couldn't really take it home to actually practice. So because a lot of classes only saw each other once a week, it was a little hard to get to make progress while we were going. But with the classical guitars, you can just take them home and then practice from there. So not only is this teaching everybody a new instrument, because even if you play guitar, classical guitar is a lot different from regular guitar. Um, and it's also giving people a chance to actually be able to practice and actually make a lot more steps towards progress, which is really, really great. Um, and then in jazz, they continue to play mallets, but are working on new jazz charts and for several voices that's requiring students to hold their own part. So the way that we did it in band previously was that 
you would have a lot, you'd have more people playing kind of the similar parts, kind of like you have in a larger ensembles where you only have like three trumpet parts, but you have like 17 trumpets. Um, so, but in this jazz ensemble, basically what they're doing is that instead of doing that, they're basically giving everybody their own part. So it makes people more reliant on themselves to actually play out, which is really, really good, especially for jazz, because a lot of the kids in there are really looking to extend past band and what they already do in band because it's another musical thing that they can do. Um, so student and as far as festivals and districts go, students this year have still been able to audition virtually and have had a lot of success this year. Um, district festival auditions did not occur this year, but they will be offering an online workshop for all students in our program this spring, which is really, really great. Um, for the New England Music Festival, um, all 10 instrumental music students who auditioned were accepted, which is really, really huge. Um, an online workshop is being developed for this spring. Um, 15 students auditions for the Vermont Allstate Music Festival, and we don't have the results for those quite yet because those get released in early April, but based on what results we've had in past years and this year's we're assuming that I believe we're thinking that a good portion of them will still get in. Um, also for the biannual all Eastern Honors Music Festival, um, MUHS had four recipients and they also had three vocal students accepted, um, which is kind of huge because the festival only accepts 1% of students from Vermont, which has a total, which means that in total statewide, only 16 people from our state are accepted to it. Um, only one other school had more than one student accepted, and that was two students. So we basically have the largest amount of students going to this festival in Vermont, which is kind of amazing. Um, and it's going to occur virtually in March with students working with conductors and then recording their parts for a virtual recording that will be released later this spring. And I believe that is everything that I have. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Hi, I guess it's my turn then. Um, I'm Zora, I use she, her, and they, them pronouns, and I'm part of choir. This year, choir has been very different than it was in previous years, um, just mostly because we can't sing indoors as much or at all. We can hum, but that feels very different. When I hum, I feel like I sound like a bumblebee because I'm like buzzing. Um, choir has been for a very long time, a nice community where students can come to sing in the middle of the day and kind of like escape from the stress of school. So I'm glad that Ms. LeBeau managed to kind of keep that energy through like this time. What we've been doing is we've been singing outside and humming inside, still practicing songs, still like learning, even though we probably won't have performances. So that's been really great. We've still been able to sing, that's awesome. Another thing we've been doing is learning ukulele and also learning to sight read and working on our music theory, which I think has made us all very, like very much stronger as musicians. So um, we've been doing compositions. At the very beginning of the year, it wasn't a composition, but we all did a special project where we learned to play a specific song and we submitted a recording to Ms. LeBeau and we had to accompany ourselves with an instrument which helped us to learn a new instrument other than um, vocals and to stay socially distant and still sing. Um, so it's very, so auditioning was another thing that has changed a lot over COVID. Uh, being like a vocalist, when you audition, it's really important that you get to see like the judges face to face, you get to see the reactions, you get to like adapt your style to like that. But it sounds, your voice sounds very different when you listen to it over uh, any recording. So it's very confusing um, to not be able to see any judges and know what you're doing. It's still kind of a remarkable experience though, that it sort of feels like within the safety of your own home, you can record something and submit it and have it um, judged by people and then see if you get into a music festival, which are all awesome experiences and some of them are still happening remotely. Uh, in addition to all of that, uh, I don't have all the numbers around who got into music festivals. I feel like I didn't do my homework there, I'm sorry. Um, but we've been doing smaller projects in order to make up for like, the lost time singing. Right now we're about to head into a project where we read aloud a children's book and then we're going to compose a background based on that, which is going to kind of help us like compose based on mood and it also incorporates something that's meaningful to us, like a children's book. It's really, it's really nice to be able to do things like this as a class because it brings us closer to our other singers. And I'm for one am really 
glad that we have the ability to have a smaller group this year because it means that we've all grown really close and we've had that great experience of being together through COVID. Um, there's also smaller ensembles such as Camerata. We're meeting in the mornings. Camerata is a small ensemble where we get together and we sing and we perform and that's kind of, that's all, but it's very special to me and it's very special to a lot of people just because it's an even smaller community where you just get to go in the morning and sing and that's an amazing feeling. And we've been singing outside. It's been freezing, but it's a bonding experience and I really love it. I think that's all I really have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zora. And Nick and Zora, thank you so much for the passion that you brought to your presentations and sharing um, what's going on. It's, it, you, it's palpable, um, the excitement that you bring to your art, and that's a lot of fun for us to hear. I'll open it up to questions for the board. I have one question for you both. Do you feel over this COVID period of time, have you grown as musicians? Nick. I would say so. Um, so I haven't, because it's been remote and I'm part of the DP program, I haven't had a whole lot of time to practice percussion like at all, um, which is like really, really annoying. And I'm like not terribly, I'm, that's like something that is a personal issue of mine that I want to resolve. But at the same time, because it's banned and we're learning just new skills for music. So while we're not necessarily strengthening the skills that we've been that or that I've since I'm a senior been practicing over the last three years, we're learning new things, which is kind of rounding us out even better. Like we're composing more, which is great, which is something that we just started to do. And honestly, it's a lot of fun and everybody's doing really, really well at it. And everybody's like fully on board with it. I mean, and then also just this year alone, pretty much everybody's been learning two new instruments, which is great. But with mallet percussion and guitar, like, and beside, and they're like really, really different. Cause if you normally play wind instrument, that's a percussive instrument and then a string instrument that you have. So then all of a sudden you have like these, you have like background ability to play the like three different types of instruments, which is kind of huge, especially if you're going into college and you're wanting to play more than one instrument, or if you just have, or if you just end up falling in love with a mallet percussion or strings, which is wonderful. So it's just giving kids a lot more opportunities that I think, honestly, we probably wouldn't have without COVID, which is kind of a bright side that we can look at it on, which I really like. That's great. Thank you, Nick. Zora? I would say we've all absolutely grown as musicians over COVID. So the fact that we get to spend that extra time that we would otherwise be spending always rehearsing um, songs for uh, concerts, because there are a lot of concerts, which was excellent. But um, the fact that we get to put in that extra time to really solidify our like base as like, as far as like music theory goes, is really important. It means that we're all actively learning something new every class. And also the fact that we get to pick up the ukulele and learn notes and learn picking patterns and strumming, that's really valuable to a lot of us who wouldn't otherwise learn a physical instrument, I guess. I guess singing is also a physical instrument, but like a handheld one, it's very important. Um, and also I think that the ability to be in like a small space and learning things together in a smaller group is also something that really helps us grow as musicians. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Chip. I, I'm president of the opera company in Middlebury, this small professional company. And, you know, in our discussions <clears throat> over the last, well, ever since COVID started and how we continue to function, uh, all these issues that you've brought up, this sort of distance and learning new skills, uh, it's, I think we'll look back on this time as uh, being a time of innovation. Uh, nothing's going to ever replace the sort of live performance when you're sitting in an audience. But in fact, how you present it and you guys learning, you know, these different ways to uh, both learn what you want to learn and expand in a way that you couldn't really imagine before. Uh, I'm not a musician, but I think the technical parts of all this are just really hard to overcome. But on the other side, as a lot of us have said, including Doug Anderson and many others, uh, this is a time we have to embrace it and go with uh, a different way that we're gonna do it. So I'm glad the enthusiasm from both of you uh, comes out because I think it's really important whatever you do with music in the future, it's not gonna be exactly the same as it was two years ago. So thank you. Any other questions, Lorraine? 
Um, first, I want to thank you guys both. Um, you, your passion definitely showed, and I'm a big fan of the music program at the high school. I had two children who were both involved in them. Um, Nick, you mentioned that you are part of the DP program, and you also mentioned something about um, issues with scheduling with the IB, and I was curious um, whether that is that because of the COVID issues or is that actually because of the IB program itself? And I also wondered if, I don't know, Nora, if you know, or if you know, Nick, but is choir also suffering because of the IB as far as kids being able to do that as well? Well, okay. So, um, basically, so I'm an IB, which is a ton of fun and a lot more work but it's, it's a lot. Um, but basically what's, ba so last year it kind of started to be a little bit more apparent that it was suffering a little bit because of IB. I think that a lot of people in my grade, especially going from sophomore to junior year, because that was the first year that we really had the IB program, um, just weren't able to fit it into their schedules because band at that point, there's only one like block of band. And since the lunch schedules where it used to be, where basically went away there it had to be during like an actual block of a class which ended up being taken up by basically everybody else's by, by basically everyone else's classes i mean so um last year for example when i went as a junior um i had a completely full schedule which meant that i had my six ib classes extended essay prep and then band um so a lot of people it just didn't really line up for that i prioritized it so that i made sure that it would so that I could actually definitely get banned in because I really wanted to do banned. But I think a lot of people were at the point where going into a lot of more work, they realized that they would rather either A, have a free block so that they could have more time to work on the large amounts of work they'd be getting, or B, they wanted to take an, a class that was offered that took place at the same time as banned. Um, so I think that was an issue last year, definitely. Um, this year, it wasn't really as much because what ended up happening is because of COVID, what happens, like I said before, there ended up being four blocks of band, basically two per cohort. So one of them took place during the normal class schedule, like where you would put a normal class. And then the other one ended up being during the first half of lunch for both the days that you'd be in school, um, which actually meant that anybody who wanted to take band theoretically could take band. So that being said, I think with COVID, they actually, the only reason you wouldn't want to take band would be is with the DP program is if you're stressed out, but not because it doesn't fit into your schedule. And that was a problem. I don't know if that will be a problem going forward once when COVID kind of goes away a little bit more. But as far as it is right now, the only thing that's really stopping DP people from doing it is over commitment and time, basically. Any other questions? Amy. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, oh, let me take myself off video so I can talk. Um, I'm just curious how you see music playing a role in your lives when you leave Middlebury and if you're planning on, if you're going to college, if you're planning on pursuing it in college and where do you, how do you see it fitting in? Um, so I think music will absolutely be a part of my life. I'm hoping when I go off to college, uh, I'm going to be able to go to a liberal arts college that has a lot of, because that's my goal, to, that has a lot of music and a lot of acapella especially. I've heard that that can be a lot of fun. I think that the experience of having done a lot of festivals in high school is also going to help going into college and with college applications. So that's a really great benefit. And also I think music no matter what form it's in will always be a part of my life from like home to school to kind of everything just because it's very important to me. 
Yeah, and for me, it's basically the same way. I think I ended up applying to basically all liberal arts colleges um, for the most part. Um, and one of the ones that I actually ended up applying to was Lawrence, which I don't know if anything you, if any of you know anything about it, but um, one of the main prominent things that it is about it is that there's this gigantic presence of music on campus because it has its own conservatory, but even just if you don't want to do any conservatory stuff, just it's very, very easy to join a band. You can basically, from what people have said, you can go outside like walk out the door room and then there's always somebody playing something outside which is just gigantic because there's just this gigantic musical presence and I've kind of loved music even when I'm not in band or doing anything it seems like I'm always just listening to different types of music and just drawing inspiration from everything so it's definitely a gigantic part of my life and even in smaller ways like just listening to music and just gaining a deeper appreciation for it I think that I'm going to carry that for it at least. And hopefully the performing aspect too, I definitely want to do that as well as composing and like basically everything else that I've learned. Um, and I think that a lot of people in band would want to do that too, even if it's not necessarily performing, but just listening to music and the deeper appreciation for it that they get through the class, which is huge. Any other questions, Mary G? You're on mute, Mayor. Uh, I'm I'm really impressed with the value that music education has brought to your to your uh, personal life. I mean, I, I'm just thrilled that I, there's this much enthusiasm, and I'm I am worried about the the scheduling. Is there any possibility of doing extracurricular music ensembles? I mean, once COVID is over. Um, I know that there's always the school plays and that you're always perf uh, getting ready for um, uh, performances, but for just jam bands or kids to get together and have opportunities to work outside of the school hours to you know, work on your craft. I, I just, just wondered if that's ever gonna be a possibility. I know we have a lot of sports and other activities. I wonder if music can also become part of that. Okay, so for choir at least, I don't know about band. I know you have jazz band, but I think that counts as a class. So for choir, we have a small group called Camerata. It's right now an all women's group, but it isn't always. Um, and it's a group of students that meets before school and we just sing together and we practice songs. It's a really great opportunity to practice songs that are just slightly more challenging than normal choir songs because we get to have like really concentrated time just practicing. And it's really wonderful. It, allows me to sing before class, which is like a huge de-stressor. And I'm so thankful to Lebeau for like putting in the extra work and like showing up early before school and putting together the repertoire for um, Camerata. It's so special and it's so amazing. Yeah, and for band at least, um, one of the main things about band is that pretty much everybody in band does a sport. I think there's very few people that don't do sports and most of them do do all season sports. So extracurricular band is entirely possible. I think Miss Severy, I mean, it's possible in theory. I'm not sure if it'd be the best option though, just because again, everybody already does sports. So having an extracurricular music on top of like sports practice every single day might be too much for a lot of people, especially if, they decide to go into the DP program at um, like when they're a junior or senior. Like personally, I do sports all three seasons and with the DP program, it's like pretty close to barely manageable. Like I don't think I could take on another like daily extracurricular activity that like definitely not. I just would not have time to actually get everything done. So if you're doing a DP in a sport already, probably not. I would say definitely not. I think that Miss Every did try either. I think it was maybe from freshman into or my freshman year into sophomore year when we kind of switched schedules and kind of got rid of the lunch block, like where you could put classes in your lunch blocks. I think that was when she maybe suggested putting jazz band before or after school just because it was like banned during like the third lunch block um, instead. So it didn't really have time for that. Um, and I think that a lot of people in that, that were in jazz band were basically said that they couldn't do that just because of how it was. So it ended up being kind of 
so basically instead of putting it after school, she basically had to put it in during flex time because that's the only time that a lot of them could actually do it, especially because if you have a full schedule and basically band is like your one class that you can kind of just squeeze in, if you're putting jazz band on top of that, you there's really no spot within your eight block schedule to put that. So you have to find another area to put jazz band. I mean, even now jazz band is basically in the second half of the lunch or the lunch TA block in the middle of the day, um, which means that it basically, if you have it set up in a certain way, you're doing band and then straight into jazz band. And you can, I think that she, I think that she puts like a lunch break in the, in the middle, but it's still like a lot because it's basically a lot of classes, one right after another. Um, so it's jazz bands always kind of been hard to schedule. I think that, but it's been hard to schedule because people haven't wanted it to be before or after school just because they don't have time. So I think that for band or jazz band, at least, that would be really, really hard and probably wouldn't be successful. But again, maybe priorities have changed now with other people. So that's also entirely possible. Thank you both. Any other questions? Peter B. I just wanted to add something. Um, so first of all, um, thank you both to Zora and Nick for uh, sharing all the awesome stuff that's happening. And um, I, I was going to hold up. I have a guitar actually in this room, Nick, <laughs> from my son who, who got a guitar and is playing it, uh, which has been awesome. Um, I did want to share on the state level, um, you know, Mary was asking about sports coming back and what's happening with the arts um, and uh, superintendents and the superintendent association is pushing to to move forward um, the conversation happening with the AOE and the governor's office to to put the arts on par with athletics. Um, the athletics has gotten you know and rightfully so has gotten lots of um, attention. It's really important for students, but arts are equally important. And um, so we're we're hoping that through that that pressure and through that engagement that we'll start to see some um, either relaxing or just other ways to to figure out how to provide more opportunity for students. Great. Any other questions or comments? Betty? Thank you so much for sharing that. It makes me so happy to see that um, we can still continue making music even through this um, COVID season. Um, overall, it sounds like you are satisfied with uh, your musical experience at the high school, but um, are there additional ways that you can think of that would make your musical experience even um, more satisfying or more, more enriching? Nick? Um, for the most part, I can't really, um, because as far as with COVID, like pretty much everything that we do, I see is beneficial in some way. And I can't really think of anything else that would be better, especially given the current COVID guidelines, um, kind of going back to before when COVID was like kind of being covid -y, um, it wasn't really like, it, it was kind of the same way, like band from my freshman year had changed quite a bit. There was freshman year, we did a lot more playing than we did ju the sophomore and junior year, um, which we kind of exchanged for more rhythmic and melodic dictation and more composition, which really I was completely fine with. I mean, I, I saw them, they both benefited me in different ways and kind of made me stronger in different areas, which helped me in playing therefore. So honestly, I can't really think of any other way to make it better. I think the way that it currently is, is pretty good. Um, I mean, of course it can always be approved on, improved on, but I personally can't find any way to. Zora? So, yeah, my music experience has been really awesome. Ms. LeBeau is a rock star. She teaches beginning guitar and choir at both the middle school and the high school. And she's just made it so special and amazing for everyone, which I'm really thankful for because I cannot imagine the amount of work that that's taken. And I think that the way that she's handled choir during COVID has been so creative and so wonderful. And I think the thing that would improve 
it the most for me was if we got more guidance on like a statewide like level that allowed us to sing inside because to me at least it seems like a little bit of a discrepancy that people can play sports such as basketball inside but we can't sing even when we're very distant um but that is completely out of the control of most of us but i mean overall music has just been so wonderful and lebo has been working so hard and i'm very thankful thanks that's great thank you well thank you both and kathy thank you for bringing these tremendous representatives of the district i gotta tell you to have have students like yourself share your passion and speak with such incredible inspiration it it brings hope to our discussions and um, we could all use a little more hope these days. <laughs> so thank you all very, very much. It is greatly appreciated. Great, so next up, I believe You're muted. Approval of the minutes from January 11th. A motion to approve. Mary G, a second. Davina, any discussion on the minutes? Great, all those in favor? Wonderful, thank you. Chip, next up to approve the bills. There was one set of bills uh, which were read on the 18th of January um, out of the general account, a total of $212,004.56. The bills were approved and um, I make a motion that we approve the bills. Second. Victoria, all those in favor? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great, so moved. Next up is report of the superintendent. Great. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk about a couple of things. Um, I, about a week and a half ago, I shared with the community um, and, and started to kind of set the stage for uh, the work that we're doing in reentry to think about what it's going to be like and what what kinds of structures and supports we're going to need for students as we leave the pandemic behind um, and as we begin a if not a regular school year next year um, at least one that's a lot closer to um, what we need it to be which is students in school five days a week and some of the limitations that are in place being lifted to be able to, to fully maximize um, our, our resources and help students get what they need. Um, so in that, in that communication, and since, since that time, we've been meeting both at the central office level um, with our ACSD principals and leaders um, and, our, um, and are bringing this on Thursday to our recovery planning team, which is a representative group across the district to start to build that roadmap to look at, at um, Specifically, we're, we're talking about um, mainly, um, I would say, two to three things. One is uh, really honing in on literacy and tier one literacy. Tier one means kind of the general level for all students and, and being absolutely sure that we're ready for the, the varied skills that we think we're going to find and we're starting to find as we do assessments um, through the winter and spring in preparing for reentry. So literacy is, is, is front and center. It's something that um, those of you that are uh, following what's happening in Montpelier, there is conversation from the AOE about some kind of state requirement around literacy. I'm not sure exactly what form that's going to take. I see Peter Conlon shaking, it, uh, not shaking his head, nodding his head. Um, so I, I think we'll see something from the state in terms of guidance on literacy, and we're kind of getting a head start on it here. It's an opportunity for us to really drill down and look at within the IB framework, how does that general tier one literacy um, support all students? So, so it's 
I think it's coming at a good time for us, uh, to be honest. So that that's that's one part. Um, we're also looking at our social emotional learning and and being sure that we're ready as we come out of the pandemic for the the needs that students have um, to really support whole whole student wellness. And we began uh, really working towards a systems approach to social emotional learning last year and uh, put together we both have positions our schools, we have that to work and, and build it and build understanding of it so that we are ready. Um, obviously, we're doing this work now, but we're ready when we come out of the pandemic and can be with students every day to, um, to be able to, to intervene where we need to, to provide supports where we need to, and to be as, as agile and flexible as possible. Um, if you read any of the literature that people are, um, are that's out right now in, in, in looking at what's happening during COVID and the impact that it's having, uh, you know, there are, there's different research that's pointing to 30 to 50% impacts on, um, on assessment scores in math and uh, literacy. So we, we also know that the, the kind of the, the normal, we, we've never accepted normal because we've we've been talking about in our strategic plan reports for five years about the opportunity gaps that we have uh, you know across all of our students and it's something that we've been working on we think it's going to be more significant um, we will know more over the next few months as we start to build assessments and and really get a handle on on where we are but we 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 realize that we have to be able to approach a new school year in a very different way than we normally do and that we we tend to think in in grades and boxes and okay I'm in fourth grade now I'm going to fifth grade and that assumes I've I've gotten all of this learning in fourth grade I'm proficient in in, in all these different skills and um, and areas that I need to be successful in the in the next grade we think it's going to to force us to think differently about even thinking about grades and kind of the standard curriculum that we cover, um, we're going to have to be flexible. We're going to have to try to meet every student where they are so that we can um, help them kind of get back, so to speak. Um, so so the, the social emotional learning and the teaching and learning we're doing kind of alongside each other, we think those two things are going to be critical. Um, the, the third thing is the, the operations and all the, the different things that we need to tackle with that. And those are kind of coming behind the, the SEL, the social emotional learning and the teaching and learning systems. Um, so that's one update I just wanted to, to share um, with everyone. And, and as we uh, continue to do this work, I'll be sharing that um, with the board and uh, with the community as well. Um, we, the second thing I wanted to mention, um, the, the transition at MOM, um, and welcoming sixth graders. So there's a, a ton of excitement about welcoming sixth graders and the MOM staff is working on a lot of the, the different pieces, um, kind of fine tuning the model and looking at, at how they can leverage things to, to maximize um, the opportunity of having three grades at, at the middle school. Uh, information was shared, um, kind of the first real information to the community was shared last week. And I think from here on out, we're going to start to try to share more information to help people understand kind of what's happening, what to look forward to. Uh, we'll soon be doing all those kinds of transition meetings. So all those kinds of things will be happening as well. Uh, and we're, we're hoping that um, we can get that information out as soon as we can. Uh, we've got, as you all know, we have um, Andrew Conforti as our interim principal right now at MOMS. And um, that position is open, the, the MOMS principal position is open. Um, that process is going to be um, ending in mid-February, where we'll be uh, coming forward with uh, the, the permanent leader of MOMS, and that permanent leader will kind of take this work and, and move forward. And um, 
finally, I just wanted to mention, uh, um, some folks have asked me about uh, the vote and Ripton secession and, and asking for details. I don't have um, any details. That is, I, I believe is happening between towns. So I think Ripton Town is communicating with the other towns to coordinate a vote. I don't know what the confirmed date of that is, um, but just wanted to mention that because a number of people have contacted me asking. Uh, Peter C. Uh, just on that final topic, uh, I got a call from our select board chair today uh, saying that it looks like the vote will take place on town meeting day. I, I was unaware, but um, statute requires that the vote take place on the same day in all of the towns. And I think that there's been an effort from the Ripton select board to have all the towns vote on town meeting day. But if, if I could just back up a, a couple of steps to um, just a couple of definitions in the first part of your report, Peter, um, would you just uh, define tier one? And then also, could you just give a couple of examples of social and emotional learning or, or what how that's addressed in a classroom? Sure, sure. I did realize tier one was gobbledygook when I said it, but I did define it on the spot, I think. Um, so, so tier one is basically um, the general curriculum that all students get. And the goal of, of any educational system is to, to have the most students learning at the tier one level. So the reason it's called tier one, there's obviously gonna be a, a two and a three, right? Okay, nod your head, right? Yep, yep. There's there's a two and a three. So when when a student at tier one, at that general level that, that all students have access to an inclusive curriculum, when a student's not learning at tier one, intervention is used. So when a student is at tier two or more significant need of support tier three, there's a system designed to provide them with whatever they need to learn to then still stay in tier one and learning in tier one. And, and so the, the goal of the system is to have everybody learning together in tier one as opposed to pulling and pulling all the time, um, which then can lead to tracking and lead to some of the issues that are, I think in some ways calcified in our traditional schooling system. So that, that's, tier, that's tier one. Um, social emotional learning is is a really broad um, kind of placeholder for a lot of the work that we do, but essentially it's looking at um, providing for the social emotional health and well being of students and doing that um, in in countless different ways. So it's it's thinking about counseling supports that they might need. It's looking at uh, ways for them to engage in their school and in their community. Um, it's looking at building groups and, and kind of peer connection. You know, it's, it's, it's taking care of, of everything non-academic for students. Um, we know that the, if students aren't, aren't in a place of real wellness, then they're not able to access learning. And so, I mean, it's a conversation I think this board has had for many years and looking at the supports that we do provide and, and that schools have taken on many of the social, emotional, um, you know, psychological, all those different needs that students have, schools own that too, because you can't separate the academics from what a student needs to, to be present and be ready to learn. And so those things are naturally and, and, um, importantly, are, are joined. Any other questions for Peter? Uh, Amy? Mine's just a quick one. Are you seeing from, from what we are observing some differentiation at the levels in elementary, middle, and high school in terms of these challenges, or is it really widespread across at all levels? 
I think I would say it's widespread at all levels, but I don't think we know enough yet to, to say anything really definitively about it. Um, I, I think we have the benefit of having our elementary students in for five days a week right now. Um, but that that doesn't mean that I, I wouldn't draw a causal connection between that and therefore they're on track and secondary is not. Uh, I mean, remote learning it is has been really effective for some students and really not for others. Um, and that's kind of the variation that I talked about, about earlier. That there, it's not kind of it doesn't clearly fall in in one way or another. So I, I think our assessment system is going to have to be really tight to be able to respond to the needs of students because they will be the things you would ex normally expect. I think are going to be um, unexpected. Mary G. Yeah, I just wanted to, in addition to the social emotional parts of wellness, um, it's also been uh, pretty evident that physical health for many of the children across the country have been affected as well. Many kids have gained mm -hmm. tremendous amounts of weight, poor physical activity. It's um, and also their connectivity with their community and their ability to socialize. So there's so much that is included in the social emotional learning besides, you know, the, the counseling or the, you know, all the things that Peter mentioned that is just so critical, but we have to look at wellness very broadly. Um, so I just wanted to add that piece. Victoria. Yeah. Hi. Um, Peter, I was wondering if you could speak to, I've had a couple people ask me, and I know that um, uh, traditionally we've had some summer programming um, for kids for whatever reason who maybe are uh, underperforming or falling behind. And I'm wondering um, if you're at the point of looking at um, having a more robust model this summer or sort of what the thinking is around summer schooling. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, timely, too, because we talked about it this morning. Uh, and we were talking about it in the context of ESSER funds. So we, we are receiving uh, funds that we have to allocate within the next month and a half or so. And we can spend them over the next, I think it was year and a half or something like that. Um, and then we have a second round of ESSER funds. These are federal funds coming through COVID aid. Uh, we have a second round ESSER two coming, um, which we'll be looking at, at kind of um, marking in, and um, you know spending in the in the next year. So, um, in in thinking about what what the needs are, that's part of this recovery planning is looking at uh, both the summer program thing that maybe we don't normally offer that we could. Uh, I think. You know, again, we, we don't know what the conditions are going to be, so so we're going to have to be thoughtful about that. Um, you know, a lot of the the graphs I'm seeing in terms of of vaccinations and and COVID have July seems like a, a period where there's there are a lot of graphs are kind of going down in July. So I don't I don't know know if what the restrictions and limitations are, but we're committed to putting additional resources in summer for students. Um, and that's, I think, both on the academic side and the social emotional side, um, including, you know, you know, whatever we can offer um, that is gonna help students to, to be that much um, more ready for the fall and just to, to provide for things that we haven't been able to during the pandemic. The other part of thinking about summer is, is also um, thinking of staff who have been working really, really, really hard for a long period of time and that are going to need a break. So I, I'm, we're also aware of that too. Um, but we're, we're definitely looking at increasing our, our summer programming um, and having it be, uh, you know, options for students to engage in things they they might not normally and also looking at academic support and and using that time to be able to help students catch up 
um, so that they're they're more prepared to to enter into the next grade that they're going into. Great. Um, Peter, on the mom's transition communication, I think the only comment I would make is um, similar to once we became kind of consistent with your communications that were going out Friday or whatever that day was, and people got into that rhythm of expectation. I think this is going to be another example where that's going to be super important. Even if there's nothing to say, say we got nothing to say today. Um, <laughs> and so telling people when they yeah. can expect the next communication, what that cadence will look like, I really encourage folks to, to deal with it the same way that you, you know, you have demonstrated over the past few months. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the, the, the threshold for starting that communication was the budget and getting through this period. So now that I think we're through the, the budgetary part of the, the planning, um, I totally agree that providing that map to help people know kind of when and what and how is super important. Really important. And we, we, we talked um, last week about you know, in talking about how exciting it was, um, that we really want to share that excitement with people too. Yep. And, and we've been in we've been in such a reactive mode. Yeah. During COVID, that we almost have to kind of wake ourselves up. Any other comments or questions for Peter? Okay, great. Uh, next up, report of the board. Facilities Master Plan Timeline, and I will turn this over to Victoria. Great, thank you. Um, so I um, met with, or I attended the commun Communications and Engagement um, Committee meeting this past week. Um, in preparation for that meeting, Peter and I uh, had met and were working on, um, as promised, a more detailed timeline for the facilities master plan going forward. Um, and as we discussed and looked at um, all the work that remains and, um, and fitting in quality um, community engagement and such, um, I started thinking, uh, I guess on top of that, getting um, Peter's email about the summer programming that he's just talked about or about um, closing the COVID gap, so to speak. And um, on top of that, the governor um, saying that he's hoping that secondary students will return to school full-time um, by April. And when I started thinking about um, the middle school sixth grade transition um, and looking for a new leader for middle school uh, as well as um, filling the business manager position, um, I started thinking, how are we, how are we going to fit the facilities master plan into a timeline with all of this other stuff going on? So Peter and I um, had talked about whether or not this was actually doable. I think on top of it, we were feeling like. Um, we're in a different place now than we were in August with COVID. Um, and certainly the recent unrest has made people feel, uh, I, I think has added stress to everybody's lives. And um, so Peter and I talked about whether or not um, we should sort of press pause on the facilities master plan in order to give administrators and teachers involved in all the various um, to do's uh, more time to focus on those things um, and then restart the facilities master plan at some some point down the line. So I brought we brought I brought that conversation to the community or communications and engagement committee this past week. Um, and I know some of well, the committee was there and then a few others attended uh, and we discussed whether or not um, we thought that was a good idea and um, how everybody was feeling about it. And we decided, uh, I think for the most part, everybody was in agreement that, that it sounded reasonable, but that we wanted to have a full 
board conversation um, about it and get everybody's input. Um, so that's what I'm hoping that we can do over the next few minutes. Um, first, I'll ask Peter if you have anything you wanna add or Amy, since it was your committee meeting, um, if you have anything you wanna add um, as background to that discussion. I mean, I think you, I think you covered it well. Uh, I, I think the, the lift is pretty significant right now. And I think the, you mentioned, you know, the impact, the growing impact of, of COVID and the pandemic and, um, and, you know, and speaking about engagement with the community. And I just, I, I think I, I see it just throughout, not just on this topic. I mean, I see this throughout our community and throughout our schools and, and people are really tired. And I think we need to focus on the really important work, which is getting students back. Um, and we need to, to also hopefully, um, you know, when we, kickstart this again to to be able to engage with community hopefully in person uh, in a place where we can kind of be together to look at the the issues and we've talked about this already the issues are not going away the you know the the excess spending threshold which we've been talking about kind of ad nauseum um, you know next year we're going to be facing a, a pretty significant probably increase in our budget, I would expect that our equalized people will be level or down a little bit. And we're gonna be, you know, looking at over a million dollars. So, you know, it's not that this problem is gonna go away, um, but I do think, you know, I, I think the board's been trying to kind of be with the community and engage together on this. And I think to, to finish this process, it would be be good just given where we are in in ACSD and Addison County right now. Um, my feeling is that pressing pressing pause makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I, I would just I would say that it's it's also it's a pause. I think that my, it, certainly my intention is not to take away from the importance or the urgency of this work. Um, but to sort of show the realization that, as you said, there is other work that really needs as much attention as our administrators and teachers can give it um, that impacts the day-to-day -day of students' lives more than this planning process. Uh, and so sort of for everybody's mental health, if we can take something off the table for a moment to let allow that work to to happen um, in a calmer way or with with less pressure um, from other things, then then I think it's a good idea. Amy, did you want to? Yeah, um, let me take myself off video. Um, and just to share some of the things that we talked about um, in our conversation, um, one was, and it probably won't affect the ultimate implementation date because we were already getting, getting uncomfortably close to only giving ourselves, if we were going to target um, fall of 22, that, that we were going to really only give ourselves 12, 14 months if we were gonna be voting on this in June. So I I was gonna at least advocate, and I know I'm not alone, for a, a fall 23 implementation date. And by putting ourselves on pause for a few months, we, that does not um, jeopardize that, that date so much. Um, that, that still makes it a very realistic implementation um, date. I would also say, from my perspective, and feel free to chime in other committee members and other folks who are on that call, but I could, I, the, the, um, the anticipation of relief among our educators who were there for the call was, was palpable. Um, and that said a lot to me 
um, that they and that they weren't speaking of their uh, from them for themselves. They were speaking for our educators, um, and we were also thinking about our families. And one of the community participants, um, you know, sent in the chat, just sort of saying, just validating that that you know families are feeling overwhelmed as well. Um, and so there's no harm as long as the implementation date will ultimately change as much as we would all love to be on the other side of this. And, and um, it, just, it just feels like the right thing to do. Ultimately, from my mind, it was about supporting the educators and, and families. Chip? <laughs> the, uh, you know, all along in this process, um, I've been sort of advocating just pushing along and, you know, those folks that wanted to, because of COVID, there was pressure for us to put this off or to delay it or to back it off or do whatever else because of the communication difficulties. I, I think what's evolved over, uh, especially probably since summertime, uh, is that this has been such a big deal uh, for everybody involved, including that sort of exhaustion component, whether it's political or otherwise. Some of us feel it more than others, I guess, but certainly educators having to deal with this, uh, I, it just is sort of overwhelming. And I, I became, you know, after thinking about it pretty recently, actually, I became an advocate for saying, well, let's pause. That's not because I sort of gave up on this process because uh, the process is still there and has to continue. But I think we didn't anticipate where we feel right now back uh, at the beginning of the COVID problem. We just couldn't have that it would be this hard, this difficult, uh, this prolonged, and we have a long way to go with it too. So I, I think I'm uh, very supportive of that. I don't wanna lose, I, I, momentum's not the right word, but I don't wanna lose the purpose and all that's going into this, whether it's facilities, whether it will be transportation, all of those other deals that we've been talking about for two years. Uh, this is a pause. This isn't a uh, rejection and then a restart at some point, I would hope. And I guess that would be one question I'd have uh, Victoria as to how she sort of uh, uh, contemplates the, the word pause. Uh, I think I would defer to, to Peter on the exact date, but I, you know, in my head, um, I was thinking summer or, you know, middle to end of summer, but um, I would defer to Peter as to sort of when he feels the capacity of the, um, of his people, you know, would be. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's going to depend on a couple different things. So, uh, you know, certainly things will, will change, I think, as the the community conditions change. So I think that's part of what we'll see change. I, I, I was thinking end of summer, beginning of school year kind of as a as a good kickoff point to to re-engage. You know, I think for me, um, you know, it's kind of balancing obviously these problems these challenges are not going away and they have significant impact on our ability to provide the resources that we need to provide for these kids but to the timeline point we're not gaining any benefit from from the added weight of taking of, of continuing on over the summer like we're not the timeline still going to be now you know, that, that 2023 at the earliest. And so given that, for all the reasons mentioned, I, I think I would, I'm in support of that. The only thing that I would ask then is that it truly has to be a pause. Like it's, this is not one of those topics that you can do a little bit of and go in and out of. Like <laughs> we have to say then pause and then kick this back up at whatever date that we say we're gonna kick it back up in because it's, it's a really, it's a, an incredibly taxing, obviously, um, body of work that you, just doing a little bit of it, then you might as well do it. So I would just recommend then that we're, it is truly a pause. Peter C. 
when when we um I, I remember back when we talked about sort of forging ahead uh with the work that we were doing and um you know two things one is we were still sort of operating in the theoretical we were sort of uh saying okay you know what what information do we need to make a decision and, and all that uh, we've done a lot with that um and so we're, we're sort of at a different point now where we're actually talking about making hard choices and hard decisions um and I think that's a time when we really do need to be very cognizant of where the community is at, our ability to communicate with the community. So for those reasons, I, I agree with everything that, that you're saying. Um, definitely. So, I, you know, I because I've been feeling the same way. There's, there's just there's just too much going on in the world. Oh, and the other thing I was going to say is that we were also at a much different place with much different expectation with the pandemic. You know, we kind of thought we had it on the run. Uh, and clearly we didn't. Um, uh, the one piece that I think we should continue to talk about, uh, because I, I don't think it's necessarily specifically only to the facilities master plan, but it is worth a, 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 dis a continued discussion, and that is our policy on school choice. And that's all I have. Bless you, Jen. <laughs> Any other comments or questions on this? Mary G. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, uh, the, the thinking, Peter, about looking at um, literacy and math and the academic deficits that are probably happening because of COVID. And I think we really do need to laser focus on, on that because that's our primary goal, obviously, is educating. Um, I, my, my one worry is if we delay um, doing this, then are we going to have to let go of more teachers sooner? I don't, I'm just worried about the budget and how that's going to impact our staffing. We can't lose many more teachers um, by any delay. That's my, my, my one worry. Suzanne? So I have to take my camera off because my internet also is wonky tonight. Um, I, I agree with Peter Conlon about not losing sight of the policy about school choice. But in doing so, I really think that we also need to continue with our conversations and discussion around transportation because that's also going to play a part in what people can and cannot um, do for their students and for, um, for their own lifestyle. So I think those two pieces really go hand in hand. Um, but I also agree that the pause has to be a pause and that we really do have to come up with a time and a date when we can start back up and in doing so, have things planned where we can actually have conversations with the community because I, I know from my own work during the day and from working with students that not everyone can access the virtual world. And um, we really need to be able to have those conversations with all of our community and not just those that are lucky enough to have um, stable internet so that they can sit and listen to our meetings. So those would be my thoughts. Thank you. Jen? Sorry, my mountains were eating my hand and then I got confused. Um, yeah, so my recollection from our meeting was kind of to get to lay the groundwork so that we can, you know, jump right back into it after the pause. And so um, not wanting to get too ahead of ourselves and our conversations because we wanted to bring this to all of you. Um, and, and now that if, if, if everybody agrees or if, if the majority agrees that we should put on hold, I feel like the next thing that at least our committee could try to do, if Amy agrees and the committee agrees, 
is to start with some of your ideas and the sort of to-do list that Victoria and Peter B came up with and try to, you know, slate it out to see like, what, what do we need to talk about and when do we need to engage and to really try to, you know, while it's still fresh in our heads now, kind of lay it out so that we'll know what the fall will look like as opposed to kind of waiting until August, you know, if we pause as of today, right? And then wait till August, it might be harder to sort of jump right back into it. But if um, if the majority pause, but a committee kind of takes it on to at least lay out the timeline, we might be in a better position to, to jump right back into it. Agreed. Yeah, the only I agree, Jen, and you don't want to lose time, right? Like you want to be able to at least do what you can do. I just would. I just think we need to be really careful of scope creep, because you know, as you, as we take things on, it this thing blossoms very quickly and starts to have a lot of other dependencies, and then information gets shared or doesn't get shared, and then we have other things that we have to address. And so I just. That's my own, that would be my only worry is being super laser focused on what will get done, what won't get done, clearly communicating that and not allowing for scope creep. I'd there, love to hear from anyone else, who, especially who wasn't at the communications and engagement about how you're um, feeling about this. Jory? Jory? <laughs> I have to like block no, it. Like, ah! <laughs> Thank you. I think that this shows a level of responsiveness to the realities of where so many of us are now. And if we have this kind of consensus on the board, we can only imagine that stress levels are high everywhere right now. I know working in a school, I can attest to the fact that stress levels across the board right now are higher than they've been all school year. It's just that like cumulative effect right now. And I think that by pausing and by responding to those realities, what I hope is that that will also cultivate, you know, some, some shared responsibility here in this process and an acknowledgement that, you know, this is not something the board has chosen to take on or created this is a collective responsibility that we all have in our communities to problem solve together to hopefully come to some kind of consensus that reflects you know so many different perspectives but i really would hope that by acknowledging where we are right now and by giving everyone a little bit of breathing time that this will just cultivate goodwill overall and a shared sense of responsibility to work together to to figure this out thank you any anyone else okay so it sounds like people are in agreement um, and that we should come up with a date or, or a time frame uh, where we believe unpaused would be appropriate, which probably is somewhere after the first week of school. Um, does that sound Doable is that, I, I don't know how detailed we want to get. I don't even know if this needs a motion. Um, Peter, what's our, what, what's our process I, here? I'm not, I, I think it might be better to return back to this, like closer to the end of this school year to see where we are and yeah, as opposed to finding a time right now. So pausing until end of this school year to, to then figure out when the restart might be. Yeah, I mean, I think talking about it in June may be helpful. Okay. Does yeah, that- I'd, I'd be in favor of that. I think I, everything's still so uncertain that I, I, I 
I think it's worthwhile to be flexible, so to speak. But now, is it possible that interspersed with that, we can talk about some of this in a general way, like school choice, or does it has does it have to be all of that be put off? I think we. I, I don't think there's any specific rule. I think um, the idea of the pause, though, is not is to sort of relieve the work duties surrounding this, you know, relieve the, the administrators and teachers of, right. of that responsibility. But in terms of general conversation, if we have time in meetings, um, I would think we can have general conversation. I mean, if we pause until the end of the school year, we'll still have opportunity to talk about the things like school choice, think about, you know, in earnest then starting to really put into place the timeline for communications as we move forward over the summer. And it just, it gives people just a chance to exhale, I think right now, um, without this being front of mind. And I, yeah. I think that would be healthy. Agreed. Anyone with any significant concerns? Okay. Anything else, Victoria, then? That's all I got. Super. So we will revisit then um, at the end of the school year. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you all. Thank uh, you. Next, next up, discussion of the annual meeting planning and format. We know this is not where I shine from a level of area of expertise. So Peter B and Peter C, <laughs> uh, I'll let you guys take it from here. <laughs> so the, well, the information- I'll, I'll just I can start, start off with- Oh, go ahead, Peter. Well, I was just gonna say, um, uh, it's a little weird. So first of all, the annual meeting itself isn't a meeting of the board. It's a meeting of the community run by the moderator. Uh, so it, it sounds like all of that is sort of pushed onto an Australian ballot. And all we're really talking about is the hearing on the budget. Is that a correct assumption? I, I think it's it's that plus the um, an opportunity for um, people that are running for the board to to speak as well yeah yeah i was and for and, and the, for people the, running for moderate anything that's on the australian ballot so the um, yeah the moderator treasurer and clerk as well 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 so then if that's under the sort of um uh title of annual meeting and we you know we have to i guess we Will we have our current moderator moderate that, which of course is appropriate? I think so. Because, because they hold that office until otherwise no longer in it. Yeah. So it's really, when I was chair, I sort of looked at the annual meeting as a time where I could sit at the board and, and breathe a little easier because I wasn't the one running the meeting. It was really up to the moderator to, to run it. Great. So Peter, what do we, we have two warnings then? Yep, yeah, the two warnings are, are part of the packet tonight. This is really just informational. You don't Perfect. have to do anything. We don't anything. have to do I anything. Just, I just, there were questions yeah. um, for people that were running for the board. So I wanted to mention that I, I think this would be an opportune time for, for all people that are running for the board to be able to speak to the community. And I don't know if the Addison Independent is doing something, you know, every, not every year, but most, most years they, they run a, a spread uh, a, about the different candidates. So I, I don't know if they're doing that or not, but. I think there'll be an article this Tuesday, just talking about who's running for lots of different municipal boards. Okay. Great. All right. So anything else on both these warnings then? 
And will folks who are running, like how will they, do they need any information with regards to what to prepare for the informational or their amount of time or anything like that? Uh, I was planning once we have the, the final um, slate of contacting everybody and letting them know to, you know, that the moderator will be providing time for candidates to speak to the community. Perfect. Sounds great. All right. Uh, next up is the equity literacy training. And Peter, you're going to provide some context to this, I believe. Yeah. So, um, a number of months ago, we talked as a, um, together, and and uh, I brought up the idea of engaging in equity literacy training as a board is something, as I had mentioned, that we've done been doing um, in the district for a long time, and um, felt like it would be good as as the board, uh, you know, continues to to kind of learn and grow together that, that we engage in this work together. Um, so I, I was tasked by the board, um, probably maybe the end of September to, to, to research and, and find resources to bring back. Um, I talked to a number of people um, and ended up um, having a conversation with Marissa Coleman, who has worked uh, with Winooski and, and other school districts. Uh, had a great conversation with her and talked to her about our board, our community, uh, the work that we've done in our school district. And um, she um, sent this list of questions she, and she said that um, in terms of a place to start, she felt like it would be much better if, if the board at least engaged in some of these questions and shared that with her so that she could kind of then think about what our needs might be uh, it could, could help to kind of craft a, a course for us to engage in. So this is really just kind of a beginning point. Um, and, and what she was hoping is that, that all of you would take a look at these questions, reflect on them, fill them out. It doesn't matter if your name is on this or not. Um, it, it's more about just kind of like hearing where we are. And, and then um, if you could, you know, maybe over the next two weeks, fill that out and um, send it back to me, then I can send all these forward to her and then have a conversation with her um, to start to think about how we do this work. I think, you know, it's, pro it's probably something that we wouldn't be scheduling at a regular board time, but we would maybe try to find other times to, to do this. I mean, it'd be great if we could be together physically, which we can't really right now, but um, I mean, to be honest, that would be ideal. Yeah. Um, for, for this, but um, yeah, so that's that's the next step. Um, Great. So in our board pack, there is the the reflection questions that you've referenced, and so if folks could take some time um, re reviewing those questions and kind of giving some thought to and putting some language there that would be representative of your reflections, and then send that back to Peter. Uh, I think if we could get that, um, what do we think, Peter, in the next two weeks, give folks a couple of weeks to kind of work through that, that would be awesome, and then go from there. Could, could that be, uh, could that include also just a couple of reminder emails, Peter, to us to say, hey, don't forget about your homework? <laughs> that I would be very that. helpful, I, I know. Thank you. <laughs> It'll be on Manage Back. You can log in. <laughs> yeah. and, yeah. Any other questions on that? All right. Uh, the next is we have an appointment uh, to appoint an ACSD board representative to the MCTV board. Uh, and I believe that appointment is, raise your hand if you think you're being, oh, well, she, we, we won't be able to see it. Oh, there she is. If, we, if you think you're being appointed, Amy McGlashan. Uh, and so uh, uh, MCTV has had representation on the board, from the board to represent on their board. Um, and we haven't had that representation for a little bit. And so uh, Kurt's reached out and has 
asked for such representation in chatted with Amy and being chair of our communications and engagement uh, committee thought that that was the most appropriate um, voice to fill that spot. And so we're gonna take action to uh, do so. So if I could have a motion, uh, Suzanne, is that a question or a motion? No, it's a motion to approve Amy or to put Amy's name forward for the position. Perfect. I have a second? Second. Thank you, Victoria. Any questions, comments, or concerns? All those in favor say aye. Congratulations, Amy. Well done. Uh, next action item we have is to approve the ACSD bank account signers. Uh, Brittany, do you have anything on this one? Well, this is an easy one. You actually don't have to take action. Um, okay. Originally, we thought that you would have to. Um, we're going to be adding Kathy Roberts, who currently serves as the assistant business manager, um, as a signer in my place. But since she'll be acting as the interim business manager for purposes of signing on the bank accounts, it doesn't require board action because the board has already authorized the business manager to sign. All right. So that's an easy one. All right. Thank you for that update. Appreciate it. Um, before we go into executive session, is there anything on other? I just wanted to put in a, um, a good word for Caitlin's committee for mom's principal search. I was involved in both the Mary Hogan and the um, high school one. It was really a great experience. Um, fun to work side by side with some of the teachers that I didn't know before. Um, was really impressed with the process. Uh, great to meet the candidates. And um, if anyone's got a little extra bandwidth and are in is interested in doing it, um, reach out to Caitlin or me. Um, so we can fill that spot. Great, thank you. Peter C. Uh, kind of circling back to one of the early topics and which is the um, Ripton withdrawal vote. Uh, I, in talking with the select board chair in Cornwall today, um, he, he said, you know, I think people are really gonna wanna know some information, essentially the financial impact of Ripton in the ACSD or out of the ACSD and sort of what the impact is going to be on members of other communities. And so I, I just think we sort of probably need to be prepared that people will have some of these questions. And, and one of those, the other thing I just say that probably for us to think about for our next meeting is, you know, the, the communities may be looking for some sort of signal from the board uh, to help guide them or at least the voters might. Um, and so the question is, you know, is it something that we want to take a position on or definitely don't want to take a position on? Just something just something to think about between now and, and the next meeting, whether um, you think it might, might be on the agenda or not. Yeah, and I, you know, I had mentioned, um, I had someone reach out from Weybridge uh, asking what was the, a Weybridge Select Board asking for clarification on the process. And as recent as today, I don't think that that, that there was a uh, clarity there. Uh, so I'm not sure how that's being managed, um, but I, I do think that there's still a little bit of unknowns as to the steps going forward. I don't know if Cornwall felt the same way, Peter, in your conversation. Uh, yes, um, I, I know the select the select board chair in Cornwall and the select board chair in Ripton uh, talked today. I don't know if it's by email or, or how. Um, I th and I think the uh, select board chair in Ripton um, had some information from the Secretary of State's office saying that one, it, it all had to be on the same day and that their um, request was that it all be on town meeting day. Um, but, 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 you know, it's not, the process is not, I don't think we're involved in it at all. It's really between the town asking to withdraw and the other towns that have to vote on it. Um, our, you know, our involvement may just simply be information providing and if we have a position that we want to take. Right. I do think it's our responsibility to 
provide the financial um, implications because I think that's, I know I've had a couple of people um, reach out just wondering how it impacts. Our yeah. Yeah, and so I think how that information is communicated then will have to be determined. Um, yeah, and, and, and I assume that's going to be a challenging request in that. Yeah. Since merging, uh, sort of disentangling one specific school and its and its operations from the rest is not easy right and just also how how you know what is going to be a consistent vehicle to get that information out to multiple communities in a way right. in which it can be accessed etc well i'm sure the local paper will have an interest in that you know not that we control that but that they we right. should be prepared for that question coming from the paper chip well we did have a we did have a discussion of this before and we, we helped uh, set a rather general statement, I thought, that said we thought we were all in this together, and that was sort of the board's position, uh, irrespective of whatever the numbers, numbers are. So, you know, I think that unless, I guess we could either keep that or or go the other direction and say we, uh, the towns are the ones who will decide and we are uh, neutral which I don't believe, but I, I guess that's, there are many different opinions. Peter B, thoughts on communication or from a financial or, perspective, what that would look like? I mean, that, you know. Yeah, we've, we've Brittany and I have talked about that and are, are kind of working on that. So I think once we get okay, that great. information, I, I think it's, you know, I think it falls to us to to share that with folks. So I think putting it on our our website or something to to help people understand um, what the what the financial implications are is important. Okay, great. Yeah. Any other comments on other? All right. Um, can we get? We have to do a motion to go into executive session. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So Suzanne. moved. Great. Go into executive session for a student issue. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you, Peter Second. C. Uh, we are now officially in executive session. So Peter B, you're going to um, remove the attendees from this process. Yep. 